this fall, Basil Sagos took a leave of absence from his day job, running the state's Department of Environmental Conservation, to essentially serve as an ambulance driver for a couple weeks in Ukraine. Sagos, who is an officer in the U.S. Army Reserve, joins us in the studio to discuss his trip and why he ventured halfway around the world. Welcome back to the show, Commissioner. Great to see you, Dave. So what was the inciting event that prompted you to go from a rhetorical supporter of Ukraine, who's also you know, helping raise money for initiatives uh, over there, to actually committing to be a, a boots-on-the-ground supporter? My wife asks me that all the time. Like accusingly? <laughs> accusingly or otherwise. I think I've never been able to sit on the sidelines very well. Okay. And... Um, you know, from the outset, this struck me as a just cause, you know, something that we all need to be paying attention to as Americans, uh, the invasion of of, uh, of a sovereign democracy in, in Ukraine, um, and that if the Ukrainians don't succeed in repelling uh, the Russians, that it will have cataclysmic impacts for all of us uh, around the world. That was my starting belief. I didn't start the year when this kicked off thinking I've got to get over there. But in meeting a number of really amazing people who were looking for ways to help, uh, the opportunity came up uh, to drive these ambulances into the country and put those boots on the ground, and I said, absolutely. And why did it make sense for you to be uh, an ambulance driver in particular as opposed to an attorney, which you are, or provide some sort of environmental uh, Mm. expertise uh, over there? Why driving ambulances? Well, I think the most important takeaway that I had from being there was that all humanitarian efforts make a huge difference. Right now, there are an extraordinary number of people getting injured, killed, whether it's civilian or military. One of the greatest needs that they have, at least in September, was medical equipment and ambulances in particular. Uh, unfortunately, they don't really need the legal advice right now. I mean, they're really in a fight for their lives. So that was the need. I knew I could drive. I could navigate. I have good situational enough awareness of uh, serving on a team like that, that um, you know, I could get over there and, and, and play a role. Um, and in particular, um, this great charity that, that I worked with. Plug you know, away. Ukraine Friends. UkraineFriends.org. Small, nimble, uh, led by a former USAID assistant administrator named Brock Behrman. They needed those boots, and they needed people who knew how to how to also uh, raise money for the cause. So I could do both those things and uh, get over there and ultimately lend a hand. Now, we did a lot more than just driving ambulances. We built playgrounds, put a roof on a, uh, on a community center that had been shattered. Um, we put a heating system in a displaced person shelter. Millions of people have been displaced. Um, so it was really um, was one of those instances where there is so much chaos, so much need that every little bit of effort makes a massive difference in the lives of people. Was there a regular day over in the Ukraine for you or something that represented how you spent most of your time? Not really. No, every day was very different. I mean, we went from massing at the border with uh, uh, Slovakia you know, pulling together all these ambulances that we were able to acquire and have donated out of Europe, uh, bring them into the country, prepare them, and then we drove all of them up to Kiev. So that was a 13-hour drive over the uh, Carpathian Mountains. Uh, one of the most dangerous things in in Ukraine right now are the roads. Um, so just being on the roads, um, you had to really be careful there. Uh, maintenance, things like that. I mean, it all focuses on the war at this point. There's not a lot of thought into the maintenance of the society. So that was a driving day. We had um, uh, days where we were doing the playgrounds. We had days where we were doing the community centers. We were touring some of the areas and trying to establish relationships with the mayors of cities that had uh, been really heavily impacted. So um, in, in doing, uh, sort of orchestrating these long-term deals for medical equipment, medical supplies, we were you know, driving through some of these villages around Kiev. Kiev, the city of Kiev is largely, at least then, you know, largely un- untouched. I mean, of course, there were some rockets that, that fell into the city. The suburbs were a different matter. You know, you, you imagine like a Slingerlands or a Delmar or a Gilderland um, just flattened mm-hmm. with every single house and business, uh, government office, rail station, all just completely destroyed. 
So uh, those were some of the days. And then we had to bring, um, you know, the ambulances out to uh, frontline units. And that certainly was, uh, was a much different experience. So if being on the roads is one of the more dangerous things you could be doing while you're in Ukraine, how did you sell this to your wife and kids? Well, I, I think my wife knows me well to know that, you know, she knows I've always been a person that had to be involved uh, that wanted to... But you could be involved in other ways. You no, don't have to be uh, driving an ambulance. No, it's true. It's true. You know, it was a, it was a delicate negotiation, mm-hmm. I think. And um, I have incredible admiration and love for her, what she was, the trust that she put in me and my kids as well uh, to get out there and do this. And, uh, and ultimately, you know, she believes, as I do, that this is a really important moment in time. And, um, and you know, people should step up in ways that they think that they can. Was it something that was difficult to explain to your kids who are young? Yes and no. I think they're smart enough to know what's going on over there. We have been following it um, just generally as a family. No, no, in the sense that, you know, no kid here uh, in the States knows what it's like to be, you know, in a place like Ukraine that's a beautiful country, which all of a sudden is now in, in many parts of the country in, in serious turmoil um, with massive damage people everywhere, thousands dead and... Um, you know, a decade or many decades of, of rebuilding ahead of them. So I think to see a shattered country like that is something you can't really conceive of as a, as a kid here in the States. Um, I tried to communicate to them. I took a lot of pictures. I showed to them, uh, you know, brought back amazing stories. And, and ultimately, you know, hopefully my story at some point in their lives will inspire them as well. Can you talk about the logistics that went into making this happen? You, you mentioned the charity that you mm-hmm. worked with. Were they responsible for coordinating this, getting you, you over to Ukraine? Or did you have to shill out money for a commercial flight to, over mm-hmm. to Ukraine and your own, I guess, body armor and other necessities for this type of adventure? They were, they were very well, um, I mentioned they were nimble. They're very well kind of composed, small, uh, small admin team that basically, um, you know, told me where to get. And I got there. Um, I'm working with them and another charity, the Saban Family Foundation, um, got me into the country. Um, and ultimately, once I linked up with these guys and began helping them with the logistics of uh, sourcing all these vehicles, getting them all to places where they were prepared and then ultimately around the country. I mean, that, that's really when I just became a part of the effort and uh, wasn't relying as much on what they would give me as, as much as I would be a, be a team player and bringing them what they needed to, uh, to, to achieve their mission. But did you have to tap into the Sagos Family Vacation Fund for this uh, endeavor? Uh, partly, yes. Um, but uh, it is uh, a very affordable country right now. And there's lots of vacancies in the hotels, unfortunately. <laughs> Food is very cheap as well. Um, you know, unfortunately, the country's in real turmoil. Um, so they're eager to have people there that can spend some money. And do you need any sort of clearance, say, from federal uh, officials to do something like this? Or do you just travel to the country as a, a, a private citizen the way someone might do for a vacation to a, a friendly country? Um, I didn't need any clearances. Obviously, you have to go through border checkpoints and, and, and whatnot. I didn't, didn't need a visa. I didn't need to register with the State Department. The State Department was aware I was there. Uh, we had a, a closing debriefing um, with uh, the number two at the embassy the day before I left, mm-hmm. uh, downloading everything that we saw, what we did, what we learned, you know, where the, where the weakness, where the, where the weaknesses are in the country right now, how you know the humanitarian side can help to uh, sustain the population over time. So, we did, we had good coordination with the U.S. government, but they weren't, you know, giving us uh, any kind of uh, permissions or or uh, you know sanctions to be there. And after a quick break, we'll continue our conversation with State Department of Environmental Conservation Commissioner Basil Sagos about his visit this fall to the Ukraine. Support for Capital Press Room provided by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. Communities across the Empire State have stories to tell. A roadside marker funded by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation can help your town or city educate the public, encourage pride of place, and promote local tourism. More about the Pomeroy Foundation's New York State Historic Marker Grant Program for 501c3 organizations, nonprofit academic institutions, and local state and federal government entities at wgpfoundation.org. 
For listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're continuing our conversation with State Department of Environmental Conservation Commissioner Basil Sagos, who visited Ukraine in a personal capacity, driving ambulances and providing other forms of relief. How did the experience in Ukraine compare to what you expected going over? It was worse than I thought it would be in terms terms of of the damage. Okay. The people were more incredible than anything I've ever experienced. The camaraderie that you feel in the country from the minute you get into the country. You can see it here, right? Everyone flying in a Ukraine flag. Imagine when you're over there and you're in the country that's being invaded. This feeling of camaraderie was was almost almost intoxicating to be near and to see um, where you had little kids in an old factory, sort of old 1930s, 1940s factories, who were dozens of them uh, building these stoves that would then be sent to the front. All these kids were too young to go and enlist, so they were doing what they could. They were learning welding skills and how to make candles, how to make stoves, how to make shoe inserts. The next level up from that, people in the cities trying to keep things going, the people that work in these establishments, food, restaurants, hotels. And then all the way out to, of course, the soldiers. Um, spent quite a bit of time uh, working with the Territorial Defense Force in helping to bring them some of these supplies, first aid kits, hundreds of first aid kits. But that feeling of camaraderie, that feeling of togetherness was something that I, I don't think a lot of us experience on a, on a regular basis, right? Where people set aside their differences to achieve a common purpose, which is survival. So everything becomes very basic there. So that, to me, was, was one of the things that I saw and, and took away most viscerally. Certainly seeing, as I mentioned earlier, seeing the, you know, the damage and how wanton it was, how intentionally brutal it was, um, how specifically it was directed to businesses and homes and farmers. Um, war crime would be an understatement, truly. Um, a, a wide swath of the suburbs of Kiev destroyed, right? These are residential areas. The city of Kharkiv, where I spent some time, massive apartment buildings that had been deliberately shelled. Uh, and then out to the front, where we spent a little bit of time, farms taken over, converted into uh, fortifications to, cr- to carry out these missions of bombardment of the cities, of the residential areas. So that, to me, this sort of the takeaway being this organized campaign of terror on a grand scale was more than what I thought it would be. I thought it would have been military operations limited to certain areas. And you see it firsthand. You see the intentional damage being done to the way people are living. It takes it to a level of terror at a state scale as opposed to something more localized. Well, then were there moments as you're absorbing all this where you wanted to pick up a gun and go to the front lines? Well, it's impossible not to feel anger when you're there. I was there for a specific purpose, right? Humanitarian mm-hmm. purpose. And I never lost sight of that. And I f- was able to fulfill that mission and feel um, feel pleased with the opportunity to, to p- participate in that. There's people there that are um, from all walks of life, doctors, lawyers, PhDs. I met a bunch of them. These, these soldiers who gave up everything. The guy who's in charge of the biggest logistics company in the country, his CEO, he's a second lieutenant now right, in Territorial Defense Force, spend time with these guys. There are plenty of people over there who are capable of picking up a gun and fighting, and they're obviously doing a great job of that. My role uh, was to help, and uh, I kept my emotions in check, kept um, my, my, um, my frank, frankly, my anger in check, and uh, was able to, uh, to make, a, make a little bit of a difference. How are you trying to harness this experience moving forward because I have to imagine you probably want to continue to play some sort of a role in this conflict, even if it isn't being there physically. Yes, well, I certainly made lifelong relationships when I was there. Um, and I, I will look to continue uh, continue that as they wage their war and, and look to rebuild. Um, to the extent I can be helpful, I will be, right? I mean, at, at some level, I'm also seeing the environmental carnage there. They'll have a multi multi billion dollar hole right there, just cleaning up after this after this war. So, 
you know, can always can always play the role of of uh, long distance advisor to folks that are that are making an effort here, effort there, and look to remain involved in this ambulance effort to the extent I can. So you'll continue to do fundraising, be pros- proselytize for the cause in your in your personal capacity Certainly. as well, probably. Yes, absolutely. And, and you talked about the interactions with people and what you saw from people. How much of that was communicated just through? what you observed almost without talking and how much was a product of things conveyed uh, through translators and how much English was spoken by uh, the Ukrainians? English is limited. Mm-hmm. We had some people with us that were, were bilingual. Interestingly, Google Translate is extraordinary. I learned that for the first time. Work, like it works extraordinarily well? It works well? extraordinarily okay. well. It really does. No free ads, but they'd like <laughs> to underwrite us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It does work, and I, I was in a, I mean, just in a couple of instances where I was able to communicate very effectively uh, using written and, and oral translation. So that was that was uh, exciting. Um, but um, I mean, as to absorbing what was going on, I mean, what is it? Ninety percent of of how you communicate is is visual, right? That's you why know? this radio medium so great. Exactly, people are. <laughs> I might be putting people to sleep right now. No, you have a good radio voice. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah, ninety percent is visual, right? You, you you're able to see and sense the landscape. You're able to see and sense crowds, um, how they interact. You know the the mood in a room. I mean, you don't need to speak a language to get to get the mood in a room. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know the warm hellos that Americans get there. That was that was a bit of a surprise, actually. I traveled in Eastern Europe years ago, um, and Europe a bunch as well, and. Um, it's not that there was hostility towards Americans, but right now there's a real admiration f- for America and the role that we're playing in helping them survive, right? All the aid we're giving, mm-hmm. military aid, uh, humanitarian aid as well. And to the Yankee fans out there, I will tell you the most prevalent hat that I saw over there was the Yankee hat. And while I like to think it's about the playoffs and they're in judges run for 62 or whatever it was, Honestly, that's, that was just a symbol of America and, and seeing, seeing it all over people's heads and all the stores. People wanted to trade my hat, uh, trade for my hat, um, and, um, and seeing that all over the place. I think it's just a, a sign that, uh, that there's, a, there's a bit of a, um, a renaissance of the American sort of brand, if you want to call it that, uh, in, in Europe. So given what you experienced with the people, but also the scope of the damage you saw, did you emerge from this experience more or less optimistic uh, about the chances of the Ukrainian people to essentially beat back one of the world's superpowers? Mm. Well, I'll tell you this. They all believe that they're going to win. Well, what do you think? And I think they're right. I think Why? Because I, I think they've got, their, they've got the right mentality for it. They're fighting for their country. They're fighting against people who don't want to be there for the most part. They're well equipped. They're fighting against an army that is really poorly equipped. And I saw some of their equipment. I saw some of their living conditions in these bunkers and trenches where they'd fought from for, for months. Uh, it was like looking at a, um, a World War I or pre-World War I uh, uh, military plan. Um, they have... Uh, the advantage of knowing their country, um, of understanding their supply lines, of having a good command structure within the military. Uh, their military, Ukrainians, are much like ours. We have the officers, we've got the non-commissioned officers, and we've got enlisted uh, personnel. The Russians have the officers and the enlisted. There's no non-commissioned corps. That's a big deal because... Decision making on the battlefield is often carried out by the non-commissioned officers. Think about like a sergeant, right? The sergeant making the call for the squad. Um, what you have on the Russian side, and I think you saw a lot of the evidence of that early on, was these generals are getting killed because they're having to go down to the front and tell the privates what to do. So you take that to a large scale. This army that's been very well trained, very well equipped, uh, has the right command structure, has the belief and the will of the country behind them has the world supplying them with equipment, the right equipment, gives them the chance to win. And I, I really do think that they will. There's all kinds of talk right now. What is Putin going to do? He's in a corner. He's losing. He looks terrible. Is he going to put off, pop off a tactical nuke somewhere? Uh, is he going to spread chemical weapons? 
uh, as he did in Syria, uh, biological weapons. Um, I, I'm not equipped to, you know, talk about whether or not he does that, but certainly um, that would seem to be a last gasp effort on the Russian side, which ultimately, um, ultimately doesn't win him the day. So this was something you did in your personal capacity, and you're speaking to me in your personal capacity, yes. not with your DEC hat on. Um, I didn't even bring my DEC hat today. Well, we've got one here if you'd like to borrow one. But with that caveat, did you still talk with the governor about your decision to do this? Because you did take a leave of absence. And I'm curious what that conversation w was like uh, when you told her, because I imagine you did tell her, I'm going to be uh, out of pocket for a little bit. Here's uh, Erica Ringwald's cell phone in case you need anything. <laughs> well, I didn't actually have a lot of conversations about it, about my trip before I left. Okay. I got permission uh, before I went. Not that I needed permission necessarily, but I wanted to at least discuss it. I got the green light, full support of the governor's office behind me, and full support of my staff as well, and some of the heads of the other agencies. I work with Doreen all the time. Obviously, I was missing a Climate Action Council meeting or two. So I got an incredible amount of support from, from the governor and from her team uh, on this. Um, and ultimately, the question was, why are you doing it? Are you going to be safe? And um, otherwise, you know, good luck and, and get, you know, call us and keep us posted if you need anything. So it was, it was uh, nothing but support from the state. I couldn't be happier. And, and finally, do you feel like you've adjusted to being back home okay? Do you feel antsy at all? Like you're not doing enough right now because you're back here? What's going through your head? Hmm. I mean, I'd be lying if I told you I don't think about it all the time. It was an extraordinary trip. And I, it was it was a um, a chance to really uh, to to make a difference. And there were highs and lows every single day. Um, you know, the inspiring people, the carnage of the cities, right? Being in the tre literally in the trenches and seeing um, how some of that war had been fought as well, um, and is being fought. Um, some of that will stick with me for a long time. Saw some things that I I wish I didn't see. And then, you know, saw uh, things like these, these kids, these teenagers, you know, who, who I said to one of them, I said, you know, you guys really are the future of this country. These are the teens who were building some of those stoves in this old factory. And, the, and he said back to me, he said, no, we're, we're the future of the now, right? We are, we are the now. We're the owning this country and moving it forward. And, it, and that, that to me was just one of those things that... Um, made me feel really good about people in general. I've been on the show before talking about people's capacity to, to do well. Yeah, uh, real soft, eh? Yeah, um, really uplifting conversations we always have. Um, but uh, I think I left there also extraordinarily optimistic about people just generally. I'm definitely someone who sees the, sees the good in somebody. And seeing them all pull together as they did, the work that they're doing, um, the way that they have been treating each other internally uh, very well. Um, just left me with a feeling like there's nothing that you can't accomplish if you have to. Well, we've been speaking with Basil Sagos. He is the commissioner of the state's Department of Environmental Conservation. Basil, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me in. Good to see you, Dave. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. UnionStrongNY.com for more information.